Welcome to all around the world who are joining us for today's Schiller Institute online conference. U.S. and European military and security experts warn the insanity of politicians threatens nuclear war. We're told in various popular media and by various politicians that the battle in today's world is between the autocracies versus the democracies. That's sort of a way of saying the good guys versus the bad guys. We don't agree with this characterization at all. And the economist and statesman and co-founder of the Schiller Institute, Lyndon LaRouche, always said, when confronted with two bad choices, always choose the third. Therefore, we offer you from Lyndon LaRouche's 1977 document, NATO in Caesar's Foolish Footsteps, a positive conception of the idea of the nation state, the republic, as a higher idea, which does not uh, deal with the mere form of government. In that document, LaRouche said, the development of the term republic has nothing to do with elections, parliaments, or such differentia. The notion of republic is associated with the notion of natural law as noble to man in a self-perfecting way. In other words, that humanity and specific nations of humanity have proper fundamental interests and obligations as wholes, interests and obligations which exist independently of aggregates of individuals taken one at a time. The state as a whole has a real noble interest and obligation which stands above the relatively heteronomic perceptions of interest by any of its citizens. However, that general interest of the state as a whole is, if properly known, the essential basis for sat satisfying the interests of its individuals. Thus, in the crudest sort of illustration, an economy in a depression cannot satisfy the material requirements of even a majority of its individual citizens. There is no equitable division of a pie, which taken as a whole is insufficient to keep all the would-be sharers alive. Now, uh, in the, the course of his career, uh, Lyndon LaRouche was known for his ability to bring great clarity to questions which were uh, apparently very, very complex. And what we're going to do is to indicate to you uh, how he answered uh, questions considering, partic particularly considering war. In 1996, there was an exchange he had with a member of the audience of the Schiller Institute about Lebanon. It was a very complex situation involving many different factors. And what he tried to do was to give the person and the audience a way of thinking about not Lebanon, not the conflict, not the area called the Middle East, but how to take the idea of the world as a whole and then arrive at a strategic conception. We have to understand what's going on here because you can't explain it, which is what people in Lebanon and so forth try to do, is explain it in terms of a nation state when that is not the controlling feature, nor is it just Syria, nor is it Israel. What you have, remember, go back to 1945. April 12th, 1945. And that's where all of these things begin to become clear. Because if you don't put this in context, it isn't clear. Remember the genius of Riemannian physical geometry is you recognize that no event contains its own cause. No local phase space contains its own characteristics. You have to define what kind of physical space-time, universal space-time is, then you find the characteristic, then and only then can you understand. Now this is, may seem like mathematics or mathematical physics, but it happens to be everything is the same. That uh, man's relationship to the universe is governed by certain laws. And there is no, in science, there is no division between social behavior, mathematical, physical behavior, the cognitive processes of the human mind, anything else. So we have, we have to get to fundamentals in order to understand particulars. It is common practice to say, let's look at the particular, let's examine each particular question, try to answer those questions, then add the thing up and we'll get the world. On the contrary, especially now, you have to start from the world as a whole. Start from the world as a whole. That's been the approach of the Schiller Institute from its inception in 1984. 
And specifically, it's been the distinctive, distinctive uh, contribution of its founder. We're now going to hear from the founder of the Schiller Institute, Helga Sepp LaRouche. Helga, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I greet you and want to invite you for this conference. So let me start with what is probably the most dangerous crisis in the history of, of mankind. Obviously, if it comes to a third world war, which this time would be nuclear, we would face the extinction of the human species because not only would there be a nuclear exchange of nuclear missiles, but following it would be a nuclear winter. And I think it was Kennedy who said, in a nuclear war, those who die first are the lucky ones because what comes in the weeks to follow is so horrible that people would wish to be dead. Now, if that would happen, and we are very close to it, everything mankind ever produced would be worthless. All the beautiful compositions of Beethoven for nothing. The writings of Shakespeare, of Plato, Confucius, Pushkin, the great statecraft of people like Lincoln, Leonardo da Vinci, and I could go on with the list, all would be for nothing. There would be even not a historian left to investigate why this happened. Any policy consideration that does not start with that reflection is obviously insane. And out of it follows that everything has to be done to prevent the outbreak from, of nuclear war. Now, on the 3rd of January this year, the Permanent Five of the UN Security Council again reiterated the very important sentence, nuclear war cannot be won and therefore must never be fought. That's a noble uh, statement, but unfortunately, the reality is quite different. Because in the recent period, the idea of a winnable nuclear war has become quite spread. And obviously, this idea is absolutely, completely insane. On the 27th of April, the Wall Street Journal had an article with the headline, the US should demonstrate that it can win a nuclear war. And then it proceeded to quote former Deputy Secretary of the Navy, says Corpsey, or Cropsey, Corpsey would be more adequate, that the US should prepare to win a nuclear war, that the US warships should be equipped with nuclear warheads to destroy Russian nuclear submarines and in that way to eliminate the Russian second strike capability. Now, it is highly questionable that that would be possible to destroy the second strike capability because of the less capable early warning system and air uh, warning systems of the Russians. They have installed an automatic second strike capability for the case if the Russian leadership would be eliminated through a first strike by the US or NATO, they have in place a doomsday machine, which automatically would send off uh, nuclear weapons to destroy the attacker. Now, the same idea of a winnable nuclear war uh, was the basis of a maneuver which took place in January of this year called Global Lightning, which uh, played out the idea of a hybrid nuclear conventional war, then a nuclear strike occurs by one or the other side. And the assumption would be that the US and NATO would be capable to survive a nuclear first strike by Russia and China. Then the war continues using other le lethal uh, systems like a missile defense system, directed energy weapons, EMP weapons, laser, cyber war, attacks from space, and go on for weeks and weeks. Now, this is obviously what not, would not happen. Ted Postol, the nuclear specialist, former professor of MIT, developed in various articles, which I can only advise people to, to study, why there is no limited nuclear war, because there is a basic difference between conventional and nuclear war. 
and it is the character of nuclear war that once one nuclear weapon is used, it is the logic of that war that all will eventually come into use. Now, in a recent dialogue with Robert Chia, Ted Postol describes what would be the effects of nuclear bombs. Please show the video. We are talking about a wall of fire that encompasses everything around us at the temperature of the center of the sun. That will literally turn us to less than ash if this thing gets going. I can't emphasize how powerful these weapons are. When they detonate, they are actually four or five times hotter than the center of the sun, which is 20 million degrees Kelvin. There are 100 million degrees Kelvin at the center of these weapons. Human beings can't imagine the scale of such heat. This is beyond anything that human beings have been able to imagine. And I don't know how to emphasize how dangerous this is. He then further describes that a single nuclear weapon would wipe out an urban area with a radius of five miles or an area of about 75 square miles and that it would only take 20% of the American ICBMs available to destroy all of Russia's ICBM, land-based ICBMs, maybe a thousand, and thus 80% of the warheads could be used for other purposes, for example, against targets in Russia, China, or Germany for that matter. Now that reality does not prevent global Britain to play the nuclear chicken game. There was recently an article by Malcolm Chalmers, the Deputy Director General of the Royal United Service Institute, RUSI, and they described themselves as the world's oldest and leading UK defense and security think tank, and they are closely associated with the British military and the British royal household. They are proposing a Cuban missile on steroids, that's how they call it, which could result over the Ukrainian attempt to retake Crimea, which would make it easier in their view to settle the Ukraine-Russia war. The headline of the article is, this war still presents nuclear risks, especially in relation to Crimea, and it was published on May 20th. Chalmers discusses how Russia could be forced into a nuclear confrontation by sending ever more sophisticated weapons to Ukraine to boil the Russian frog. Now, you all know the story, if you saw, at least so the story goes, if you throw a frog into boiling water, the frog would jump out. But if you put the frog into cold water and then slowly turn up the heat, the frog gets cooked. Now, they think that boiling the Russian frog you can arri uh, uh, arrive at by progressively increasing the size and sophistication of the weapons they have prepared to supply Ukraine. Um, so because of those weapons, uh, Ukraine would then be able reversing the most of Russia's recent territorial gains, including Gerson and even Mariupol. Also, those weapons and territorial gains to destroy could be used to destroy bridges, railheads, storage sites, and air bases inside Russia. Then they would move to retake Crimea, strike at a, quote, tempting target like the Kerch Bridge, for example. And now this would lead to a Crimea, Crimea missile crisis, Chalmers argues. A specific threat to use nuclear weapons in relation to Crimea might be viewed by Putin as a way to restore some of his coercive power if he and the United States doubted whether he would deliver on such a threat. If a red line were not accepted by Ukraine, Russia might then feel that it had to consider a series of further escal escalatory options, such, such, such as putting its nuclear forces on even a higher alert. They are already on alert. <clears throat> Faced with the alternative of the likely loss of Crimea, 
Putin might believe that the Ukraine, with the US encouragement, would be likely to blink first. It would be a moment of extreme peril with all the parties seeking to understand the intent of each other, even as they looked to pursue their national interest. Precisely because of the peril inherent in such a situation, a nuclear crisis of this sort could make it easier for leaders to make a difficult compromise. Provided that the war was ended and the blockade of Odessa lifted, Ukraine leaders might be willing to postpone a settlement of the Crimea question. For Putin, the failure of the invasion and the subsequent success of the Ukrainian counteroffensive would, be, would have been a massive humiliation. But he would at least be able to argue that the might of the Russian strategic arsenal had at the moment of great national weakness successfully deterred NATO's designs for dismembering Russia. This could be enough for both sides to avoid the worst outcome of all. This is absolute complete insanity. What he calls the Crimean Cuba missile crisis on steroids would mean that the two largest nuclear powers would basically go to the absolute brink of nuclear war. Now, obviously, this Rusi is only a think tank, but it is one which informs British policy. And therefore, the question is, if, is, is this not a violation of Article 2, Number 4 of the UN Charter? Because this is not just the form, some form of incitement to war, but an incitement for nuclear war. And if there is no international legal uh, <clears throat> definition of that yet, it would be very ur urgent to, to make one. If this nuclear chicken game goes wrong, for starters, all nuclear weapon depots in Europe would be a target and be reached in a few minutes. And there would be no more Germany. Ever since Putin announced the existence of the new Russian nuclear systems on March 1st, 2018, like the hypersonic missile Avant-Garde, intercontinental missiles with 20, uh, it, which is an intercontinental missile with 20 Mach speed, highly maneuverable, then the hypersonic cruise missile Kinshal, nuclear-powered cruise missiles, fast underwater water drones, laser weapons. <clears throat> the possibility exists, therefore, that Russia could position its sea-based nuclear hypersonic cruise missile Zircon at the coast of Washington, D.C., of which Russian military experts have said that they can reach Washington so fast that the United States president has no time to escape on Air Force One. The war would not be regional, regional, it would involve US and British targets as well. Tulsi Gabbard has made a video where she shows how all the US cities would be hit by these nuclear weapons. That reality would be clear to the population, they would immediately try to get rid of the political leaderships who say heavy weapons to Ukraine, even if that involves the risk of nuclear war. And you can fill in who of these politicians have said that in the recent period. It's terrible that we have a war in the middle of Europe. Putin did start it, but Patrushev, the head of the Russian National Security Council, said that this occurred at a moment where the statehood of Russia was in danger and that it was a preemptive, quote, technical military action. That they had proof of a pending major Ukrainian attack on the Donbass, and this following after eight years of what Putin has called genocide, in which 14,000 civilians have been killed. It is clear that the West never responded to the Russian complaints about that, and many of these char charges, charges have indeed been confirmed by the OSCE. Now, what is at play here is a basic assumption 
that the US, the European Union, Global Britain, NATO, all are the good guys and that Russia and China are the bad guys. Therefore, only the rules-based order is good with Western values and those who don't have, quote, our values, uh, you know, are, uh, you know, bad and therefore NATO East expansion is not a threat to anybody because NATO is good. It's not a threat to Russia, not a threat to NATO, nor, uh, nor, nor is Na global NATO a threat to China. That is the narrative, but it is not the truth. The policy of boiling the Russian frog, or what the British call boiling the Russian frog, has been there since the end of the Soviet Union. Step by step, go for the encirclement. James Baker III on the 9th of February told Gorbachev several times that NATO would not move one inch to the east. There are many time witnesses who have confirmed that. Genscher is on a video uh, to be seen saying that. In reality, when the Warsaw Pact dissolved, NATO lost its raison d'etre and it would have been absolutely possible to make a peace order. There was a historical chance, like it only comes once in a century. We called it at that time the Sternstunde der Menschheit, the star hour of humanity. We proposed as a peace order, first the productive triangle Paris, Berlin, Vienna, which was supposed to beef up the economies of the Comic-Con. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 91, we extended that to be uh, into the Eurasian land bridge, uh, and we called it already then the New Silk Road. But almost at the same time, there was a CIA study in 1991 saying that Russia has more raw materials and better skilled labor power than the United States, and therefore economic development of Russia would not be desirable because otherwise there would occur, there would develop a competitor on the world market. And as a consequence of that kind of thinking, Jeffrey Sachs, the professor, uh, implemented in not only Russia, but all of Eastern Europe, the shock therapy, which in the case of Russia led to a demographic collapse, which resulted into 1 million Russians less per year because the death rate was so much higher than the birth rate. Yeltsin was the darling of the West, and only when Putin came in and started to reverse this decline of Russia, the demonization of Russia started. And it had nothing to do with what Putin did, because Putin was very open for cooperation with NATO, with the West, to work on the common European house, as Gorbachev had put it. But he did not agree the putting Russia into the status of a third world country only exporting raw materials, but he started to, you know, re-industrialize or he tried at least to re-industrialize uh, Russia and give it some uh, status as a global player. The demonization of China occurred when China, which was, you know, first regarded to be some country which could be integrated into the liberal order by letting it join the WTO, but when China succeeded with its economic miracle and not submitted to the Washington consensus uh, and not accepted a liberal democracy, the attitude changed very quickly. China was able to lift 850 million people out of poverty, but especially when the Belt and Road Initiative uh, was put on the table, giving the developing countries for the first time the chance to overcome poverty and underdevelopment, the systematic demonization of China happened. And now it is an irony that the combined campaigns against the West, against Russia and China, accelerates them to go for an alternative system, especially together with the weaponization of the dollar and the euro, they have no other choice than to create a new financial system. Now let's take a look at the situation in Germany, because that is a key factor that Germany is not a sovereign country. 
and that has to change quickly if Germans want to survive. Chancellor Scholz on April 22nd said no heavy weapons to Ukraine, that he would do everything to prevent an escalation which could lead to World War III. It took exactly three days later until he announced that Germany would send Gepard tanks when Secretary of Defense Austin conducted a big meeting in the airbase in Rammstein. Scholz also went for a 100 billion armament program for the Bundeswehr and is pushing now a 2% increase of the military budget to be put in the Grundgesetz in Germany. That means Germany at this point is doing exactly what the US and the British want them to do as a faithful vessel. What this social democracy is doing to former Chancellor Schröder right now is a complete disgrace. Schröder has one big, uh, you know, uh, has done something very good. That is that he did not allow Germany to participate in the war in 2003. But he is being made by the SPD right now into a pariah. The SPD is now undertaking a complete revision of the detente policy of Willy Brandt and Egon Barr, namely the policy of change by approach, which was the reason why it was possible to have a peaceful unification of Germany, which was not self-evident given the role of the Germans it was the Nazi war against Russia in the uh, Soviet Union in, in the Second World War. Now, the new uh, head of the uh, SPD, Klingbeil, announced that he would make a complete re review of the relation to Russia, which in parenthesis, the foreign minister Baerbock wants to ruin, like you know other people in the United States and even Le Maire, uh, French finance minister um, want to absolutely crush, ruin, smash Russia. I mean, these were all words used. And Klingbeil also said that he wants to start the relation with the East European countries. Now that thinking to, to denounce the tradition of the detente of Willy Brandt, of the East policy of the SPD, is completely oblivious to the history. As I said, the German unification would not have been possible without these stepping stones. So they behave as complete brave vessels. That is why we need urgently a new security and development architecture in the tradition of the Peace of Westphalia. And that can only occur if it comes from a combination of international countries which then outflank such stupid policies like that of the German government right now. What this Peace of Westphalia conference, which we push are pushing to be convoked, must start with. It must establish the five principles of peaceful coexistence, the so-called Panchel, which was established in 1954 by India and China, and which is still to the present day, the only formula which can be the basis for peace. First, there must be mutual respect for each other, territorial integrity and sovereignty. Second, there must be mutual non-aggression. Third, mutual non-interference in each other's internal affairs. Fifth, equality and mutual benefit and peaceful coexistence. Then I would add to that, there must be in light of what I said about the uh, destructive power and danger to humanity of nuclear weapons, there must be a mutual elimination of all nuclear weapons based on the principles defined by Lyndon LaRouche in his famous, what then became the Strategic Defense Initiative, which is the idea that all nuclear powers should work together to make nuclear weapons technologically obsolete through the development of new weapons based on new physical principles. There must be a re reorganization of the hopelessly bankrupt neoliberal financial system 
because that is the drive for war. The reason for the immediacy of the war danger is that the transatlantic financial system is about to blow out in a hyperinflationary collapse. And that is why they are so desperate not to allow a different system to emerge. This step, the first step has to be the implementation of a global class deagle banking separation to end the casino economy for good. Then in every country, there must be a national bank in the tradition of Alexander Hamilton and the first national bank of the United States. Third, there must be a new credit system providing low interest long-term credit to overcome the underdevelopment of the developing sector. Then, because we have right now uh, 1.7 billion people facing starvation, 2 billion people who don't have access to clean water, which is a reflection of the fact that the present productive capability are not enough to maintain the present population of 8 billion people. Therefore, we must increase the productivity of the economy by an order of magnitude, which means we have to have a crash program for fusion development. We are very close to breakthroughs and commercial fusion is absolutely in reach if we now uh, go for a crash pro program. And we need international cooperation in space. Internationally, we have to build together a village on the moon a city on Mars, and eventually interstellar space travel, uh, because please show the picture. There are, according to the Hubble uh, telescope, and now we will hear more from the James Webb telescope, there are at least two trillion galaxies. And one human species is barely enough to investigate the laws of our gig gigantically big common universe. Then with the reorganization of the financial system, we absolutely have to build what we pro produced already in 2014, a blueprint for a global development, the name of which is the new Silk Road becomes the world land bridge. Please show this slide. Then the lesson to be learned out of the present incredible Russophobia, uh, xenophobia, hatred against other people. We have to have a dialogue of the best traditions of all cultures. Because if all people would know the beauty of the Chinese, the Russian, the Indian, the African, the Persian culture, and many other cultures, well, it would mean you would start to love these cultures because knowledge of these other cultures means you all of a sudden see that you become so much richer by knowing them. So the most important element to overcome the present existential crisis is something which is right now absent from politics, but it is in the nature of human beings and therefore we can mobilize it. And that is love of humanity. Thank you. Helga. Thank you. And if you've just joined us, we want to welcome you to our Schiller Institute online conference, U.S. and European military and security experts warn the insanity of politicians threatens nuclear war. And you've just heard Helga Sepp LaRouche, the founder uh, and head of the Schiller Institute. Our next speaker is General Leonardo Tricarico, the former chief of staff of the Italian Air Force. Welcome, General. Okay. Uh, we, Thank we're you. not getting it. Good oh, evening, we're, okay. everyone, we are, okay. everybody. Let me allow to express uh, several doubts on what I heard by the founder of the Schiller Institute, especially concerning the part regarding a confrontation a nuclear confrontation and the various doctrine to be used in these cases. I wouldn't go so far, but I would stick to facts as they, as we have seen them, as we are, are leaving every day to try to understand 
what can we do to stop this senseless, meaningless war? Therefore, among the things that the president said, I would uh, pick up one, the rules. She spoke about some rules which uh, she sees as uh, pillars of a new security, maybe a world security system. I would like to uh, remind you that one character of this uh, war is the break of any, any rules. Starting from rule number one, the use of force. force. All militaries, especially Western militaries like myself, know that uh, there are some rules in wars. These are rules used by NATO and used by any military, Western military instrument would uh, use. These are the rules that Russia has broken in these three months, and which she had warned about it already in Syria, showing the way they used to use, intended to use uh, strength uh, in a non-controlled way or without conditions. This is the first rule, which in my view must be remembered and re-established. And I don't know what kind of pragmatism or condition could re-establish military confrontation to re-establish uh, rules that safeguard human lives, especially innocence. This must be the first line in uh, a planning a bombing uh, mission. Second rule, and these are rules, uh, everybody should Remind, remember this. These are consolidated rules in uh, all countries that in 1949 came together around law, laws and they are still together. The first rule in NATO says that member countries commit to solve in a peaceful way any controversy that could involve them. I repeat, member countries commit to solve in a peaceful manner any controversy that uh, involves them. So I, I would ask you, all of you, if there was one NATO country that has raised its voice asking for respecting this fundamental rule. But we have seen exactly this country. We have seen pushing to solve with strong manners this controversy and and go cost what it costs, at all costs. This is the first rule that was broken, which we should one day take up again when everything is over. This is article number one of NATO. Let's go to article number four. Article number four says, each time a member country thinks that there can be a danger for its safety or for the alliance's safety can ask for a consultation among allied countries. This article number four was invoked by nobody, but the contrary was invoked. We have seen uh, American Minister of Defense together 40 countries in Rammstein, not to advise about an attack by an enemy country like Russia, but to, pro to plan a strong defense until the last blood. This Austin said, the Minister of Defense of the United States, he spoke about, about uh, weakening Russia until Russia represents no danger for anybody. This is what he said. This is the interpretation of Article 4 of the NATO Treaty by the United States. Let's go to Article 10. Article 10 says that member countries can invite, but with unanimity votes, other countries to join NATO, if this produces an increase of security of the North Atlantic area, good. Two countries ask to 
to join and naturally everybody sees that this is not bringing an increase of security but exactly the opposite that is a further destabilization of a situation which is already much compromised and despite this they run to accelerate this interest in, in NATO and this just to to mention the main rules uh, and then I will I will I will finish I will not uh, use more than the time I was allotted there was a break of the rule of behavior so in this circumstance the United States threw the mask off and they abused reckless their position of majority inside NATO and giving rules and behavior rules to everybody and using for this a megaphone called Jens Stoltenberg and in the contrary direction of what NATO principles are which they as main shareholders should uh, respect so I will conclude with saying that common sense should prevail again it's not possible that the United States speak for the first time about a ceasefire only after Mario Draghi's visit a few weeks ago it's not possible that they don't they don't commit to produce a negotiation but only some countries promote it some countries who have a weak voice like Turkey Italy France even Israel so we need a serious commitment, serious engagement, finding wisdom, pragmatism again, because finally, instead of pouring gasoline on the fire, like everybody, everybody is doing, in a hype, in a warmongering hype, we should find wisdom again to promote a negotiation which is the only way out of this situation and cer certainly I don't want to even think about the nuclear danger. Thank you very much General Tricario and if you've just joined us we want to welcome you to our Schiller Institute online conference your U.S. and European military and security experts warn the insanity of politicians threatens nuclear war. Now You've just heard, for people who have just joined us, from General Leonardo Tricarico, uh, former chief of staff of the Italian Air Force. And before we go to our next speaker, we have a couple of questions for General Tricarico, because he's going to, I think his schedule is a little bit limited. Uh, so we've got a question in, which was in Italian, and luckily I'm not going to have to translate it. Uh, this is a question from Ari Aureliano Ferri from Italy. Uh, and here's what he says, and uh, the Italian, I guess, is available already, so uh, you can uh, translate simultaneously, I hope. Uh, and the question was, I've read in an interview with you about your criticism of the way of conducting the military operation in Ukraine by the Russian army, in particular with regard to an alleged poor performance by the Navy and Air Force. However, I have also read independent analysts such as Scott Ritter, who, while not sparing any criticism of the initial phase of operations due to intelligence failures, argue that while we have been accustomed for 30 years to seeing the U.S. military leveling everything and then going to see who died and the damage caused, here we are faced with very different objectives. And therefore, both the strategy and the tactics used are necessarily different than sometimes appearing uh, fallacious to a Western observer. Indeed, Moscow is getting what it claimed from the start. So what is the truth? La verità è che l'assunto, eh, diciamo, perlomeno quello principale da cui è partito l'ascoltatore è completamente falso. Ossia, io una guerra l'ho fatta, l'ho fatta eh, da protagonista, ero il vice comandante della coalizione multinazionale nella guerra sui Balcani, e, e non è molto elegante dirlo, ma abbiamo la possibilità. Uh, uh, the translator needs to mute, or he, the general, needs to mute. Uh, 
generally, oh, thank you. Very good. Excellent. Okay. Could okay, if we could start over? He made the war. Make sure we get the this answer. This was in the Balkans, and he said it's not elegant. It's not elegant to say this. So there is an assumption which is wrong in the question, in the listener's question. I was saying that I speak, of course, not because I read some books or because I heard something, but I speak on my direct experience. I was the deputy commander of the multinational coalition in the Balkan conflict in 1999. We led 30,000 bombing missions with the number of casualties estimated in 370, 430 deaths, 370 to 400. In 78 days of bombing with 30, more over 30,000 bombing missions. So this means that it is not the criteria, the criteria of using force is not of uh, destroying everything because this has been invented by somebody, I don't know who. Uh, the listener mentioned an author whom I don't know, but by my with my experience, I can say that this was not the case. Therefore, we must take the current players, the current enemies. I don't know with what mean, but we must invent something. We must, they must use force according the criteria which everybody knows well, which safeguard human life as the first concept of planning war missions. This is the message which on the basis of my experience of what I've lived and what I, I am living, I feel I can formulate with strength towards those who have the power to take decisions. Said that I confirm that the Russians are fighting a battle, which the old style from a conceptual standpoint, and it is from this standpoint, from from the technical profile, as uh, thirty years have not passed by since technology, media technology made the jump forward. Okay. We have a second question for the general, and then we'll resume uh, the, uh, the speakers. And this one is from uh, Jeff Lindell, U.S. Air Force, retired. And he's asking, this pertains to the 1962 Cuban Missiles Crisis. And the question is, what is your opinion of the role of the United States deployment of Jupiter missiles to Italy and Turkey in triggering the Cuban Missile Crisis? We are talking about an era in which there were balance. We had balances. We had certainly, we had certainly the danger of destabilizing those balances, but we had a mechanism of compensation which has worked very well. So well that there was only that circumstance in which we were on the verge of the abyss. And, but later on, this balance of terror has become instead an instrument of destabilization as it's occurring today. Therefore, what should we do? We must terminate this escalation. There is no other way than negotiation. And it's natural that we must strengthen our defenses. This is out of question. From this standpoint, we in the West have an imperative duty a commitment which we must take because the balance towards missile threat, we must achieve this balance like other countries have done, maybe better than us. Also because the Schiller Institute president evoked that family of uh, missile 
vectors which we saw exhibited by Putin, which we hope will, will never be used, especially with the uh, uh, lethal uh, warheads. Thank you very much, General Chikrariko. And we are going to hope you can stay with us. I know you have a limited schedule. Uh, and we're going to now move our program to our next speaker. But thank you very much. Now, our next speaker is Colonel Richard Black, retired, former head of the U.S. Army's Criminal Law Division at the Pentagon and former Virginia State Senator. Welcome, Colonel Black. Thank you very much. First, uh, I love my country. Uh, I fought in Vietnam. I risked my life hundreds of times. I bled for it. Um, I flew uh, 269 helicopter missions in combat. Ground fire hit the helicopter four times. Uh, I volunteered to be a forward air controller with the 1st Marine Regiment and fought in 70 bloody combat patrols. I was wounded. My radio men were killed uh, fighting to uh, rescue a surrounded outpost. I served 32 years in the military, the first as a Marine pilot, but then as an Army JAG officer. I retired as Chief of the Criminal Law Division at the Pentagon, where I testified before Congress, advised the Senate Armed Services Committee on matters of national importance, and prepared executive orders for the President's signature. That said, I am adamantly opposed to our war in Ukraine, a war which has spun dangerously out of control. After the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, NATO began advancing aggressively eastward, finally reaching Ukraine. In 2014, Ukraine needed financial help, and Russia and the European Union made competing financial proposals. Ukraine chose Russia's aid package which triggered an immediate response. The Central Intelligence Agency and British MI6 organized a violent revolutionary coup that overthrew Ukraine's legitimately elected president, Viktor Yanukovych. Despite the fact that Russia is the first language of almost a third of Ukrainians, the revolutionary junta quickly deleted the constitutional provision that designated Russian as one of Ukraine's two official languages. This course made it difficult for Russian speakers to transact business or to conduct their daily affairs. Crimea and Donbass were Russian speaking areas that refused to recognize the hostile revolutionary junta as the legitimate government of Ukraine. For some 500 years, Crimea had been part of Russia only a historic anomaly had placed it inside Ukraine's borders. Crimean citizens declared their independence and then welcomed Russian troops who entered quietly. Afterwards, Ukrainian soldiers left peacefully, and Russia annexed Crimea after its citizens voted overwhelmingly to resume their relationship with the mother country. The two Donbass republics declared independence, and in response, the revolutionary government of Ukraine made war on them. Over 14,000 people have died in that war, uh, and this, this was prior to the, the uh, actions of, of Russia in Ukraine. <coughs> After the 2014 coup, the U.S. and NATO flooded Ukraine with weapons and advisors, <coughs> helping them to prepare for a war against Russia. NATO began troop buildups across Eastern Europe. Marines were stationed in Norway. We started discussing nuclear weapons in Poland. Germany's newly elected government renewed its commitment to station nuclear bombs on German soil. <coughs> As tensions mounted, Russia made repeated calls for peace, but the trap had been set by NATO. By late 2021, Ukraine had amassed many thousands of troops for an attack against Donbass, which lies right on the Russian border. 
President Putin was desperately trying to avoid war. In December of 2021, he advanced specific written proposals to NATO. But NATO was hell-bent on war and dismissed his proposals. So with hopes of peace dashed and faced with an imminent invasion of Donbass, President Putin ordered a special military operation in Ukraine. El presidente Putin ordenó una operación especial militar en Ucrania. Ukrainian troops were battle hardened and after eight years eh, of fighting eh, against the Donbass, um, Russia at the same time had a peacetime army with little ground experience. It's true that their air crews, crews were highly experienced after fighting in Syria, but their ground troops played a small role in that war and few Russian soldiers had fought in the tiny war in Georgia or while supporting the Donbass. Moreover, the delay occasioned by Russia's desperate peace overtures meant that the ground was thawing, making armored attacks very difficult. And compounding those disadvantages, Russian troops attacked using very strict rules of engagement. They were designed to minimize civilian casualties and avoid property damage, hoping that Ukrainians would put up little resistance and the operation would be very brief. That proved to be quite an error, and the Russians were surprised to find themselves fighting a very determined enemy. Adapting to the reality, Russia revised its strategy to confront Ukraine's stiff resistance with much greater force. They refocused their efforts on capturing the seacoast and eliminating Russia, Ukraine's threat to the Donbass. The revised strategy has succeeded. Russia has just captured the key port city of Mariupol, capturing its 2,500 remaining defenders. And Ukraine's forces near the Donbass are trapped, enduring withering artillery fire that is destroying thousands of their finest troops. Those troops cannot be easily replaced. Unlike Russia, the US and NATO were fully prepared for war. Russia was overwhelmed by a global media propaganda blitz that generated intense hatred towards Russians. The West is now in the grips of war hysteria. So intense is the hatred that Russian amputees, those with cerebral palsy, the blind and men in wheelchairs are banned from competing in the Winter Paralympic Games. The U.S. president talks of parents naming their children after Javelin anti-tank missiles. Since 2014, we poured billions into arming Ukrainian soldiers to kill Russians. And now we've issued a gargantuan $40 billion check, ensuring a dramatic escalation of this totally unnecessary war. Some politicians have even begun preparing Americans for a suicidal nuclear war. Republican U.S. Senator Roger Weicker said, we may consider sending U.S. troops into Ukraine and that he would not rule out launching a nuclear surprise attack, a first strike in nuclear parlance. In other words, we should consider launching a Pearl Harbor style surprise attack, one that would rain down nuclear bombs on the streets of Moscow and St. Petersburg, killing millions of innocent men, women, and children. The Biden administration has become insanely reckless. DOD orchestrated the sinking of the Russian cruiser Moskva, flagship of the Black Sea Fleet. NATO almost certainly controlled and fired those missiles. And this, of course, is an act of war. Have we gone mad? The U.S. admitted complicity in the ship sinking and also conspiring to assassinate a dozen Russian generals. Now, what would we do if Russia took reprisals? 
They could easily sink an American aircraft carrier with hypersonic missiles for which there is no effective defense. What if they began assassinating American generals one by one? President Biden was reportedly livid over leaks disclosing U.S. complicity in the sinking and in the assassination of Russian generals. But perhaps he should be less concerned about the leaks and more concerned about the reckless acts themselves. Even the New York Times has become uneasy, reporting nervously that war is becoming more dangerous for America. This is our 1914 moment, that fateful year when the assassination of the Archduke of Austro-Hungary triggered a tangle of military alliances, plunging the world into a war that killed 20 million and set the stage for World War II, which killed another 50 million afterwards. Just two assassinations caused that. We have already assassinated a dozen generals and sunk the flagship of the Russian fleet. On May 13th, 2022, Steny Hoyer, the Democrat House Majority Leader, said that we are now at war with Russia. During her visit to Kiev on May, in May, Speaker Nancy Pelosi pledged to wage war until victory is won. Retired General Breedlove, the former Supreme Allied Commander of Europe and a close Biden military confidant, proposed landing U.S. forces and advancing two-thirds of the way through Ukraine to the Dnieper River. The U.K. has begun considering naval action to break Russia's naval blockade in the Russian Sea, in the Black Sea. This is an act which risks retaliation for the sinking of Russia's flagship. Now, President Biden says U.S. troops won't fight the Russians in Ukraine because this would lead to World War III. But at the same time, he signed a $40 billion Lend-Lease package reminiscent of the same one Franklin Roosevelt signed as he coaxed a reluctant nation into entering World War II. But there's a great difference between Franklin Roosevelt's world and Biden's world today. For Russia and the United States are the world's great nuclear superpowers. At any moment, each has 1,400 nuclear warheads standing at the ready for launch. Even if we did launch a massive surprise attack on Russia, we can never destroy her large fleet of nuclear submarines. Many of her hypersonic missiles would launch early and many other bombs and missiles would survive the initial attacks. Russia would then retaliate, turning New York City and Washington DC into radioactive glass. Few would survive in major metropolitan centers, Atlanta, Chicago, San Francisco, Detroit, Los Angeles. Yes, we would destroy Russia and we would destroy China too, but neither Europe nor Asia would be spared. Japan would suffer a nuclear holocaust that would make Hiroshima and Nagasaki seem like brush fires. London would disappear from the earth. Paris, Brussels, Berlin, and Rome would perish. And for what? To enrich the sons of corrupt politicians who line their pockets with insider deals? For the glory of some demonic new world order? Henry Kissinger has called for peace negotiations within two months before the war creates upheavals that cannot become overcome. He cautions us not to get swept up in the mood of the moment. Ambassador Arnaud, former French ambassador to the US and UN warns, right now we're sleepwalking to nobody knows where. But we know exactly where this leads. 
the unfolding phantasmagoria foreshadows nuclear war and a great apocalypse. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Black. And if you've just joined us, we want to welcome you to our Schiller Institute online conference. U.S. and European military and security experts warn the insanity of politicians threatens nuclear war. You've just heard Colonel Richard Black, former head of the United U.S. Army's Criminal Law Division at the Pentagon and former Virginia State Senator. Uh, our next speaker is Eric Denisay, the director of the French Center on Intelligence Researches. Hello. Before giving an analysis of the Ukrainian crisis, I would just like to make a few introductory remarks. First of all, I would like to express my sympathy to the people who are victims of this crisis and also to say that if it is appropriate, of course, to denounce the Russian attack, it is also appropriate to denounce all the violations of international law, that is to say, those that led to the Ukrainian aggression in the Donbass, and unfortunately, those that our American allies regularly carry out in the name of the fight against terrorism throughout the world, notably in 2003. What seems important to me today is to recall how we got there and how this war, which should never have happened, ended up happening. It is not a question of being pro-Ukrainian or anti-Ukrainian, pro-Russian or anti-Russian, but of analyzing the facts with the coldness of the, and the rationality which is required. First of all, it is important to remember that this war should never have taken place. It is a conflict that should have been avoided and finally in which all the actors today involved directly or indirectly have their share of responsibility. It is necessary to recall, first of all, a fact essential for me, which is that at the end of the Cold War, NATO should have been dissolved. It is an organization whose sole purpose was to protect the West from the Soviet threat, from the expansion of the proletarian revolution and from the Soviet military threat, and it should have disappeared at the end of the Cold War. This simple fact of having kept it has been one of the origins of the problems we face today. We must also remember that for 30 years, whether we like it or not, there has been a real humiliation of Russia, unkept promises of the West, which have not only reinforced dissatisfaction, but also Russian resentment towards the West. The lies that have been served to Moscow on a regular basis over the years have only increased the gap between the two parts of the European continent. Of course, there was also the Maidan coup. I recall that President Yanukovych, as corrupt as he was, like all his predecessors at the head of Ukraine, had been legally elected and recognized by the representatives of the OSCE, and that it was therefore a revolutionary coup d'etat which was carried out to remove him from power, supported by the West, and finally in violation of all democratic rules. It was followed quite quickly by the ostracization of the Russian-speaking populations of Donbass, and very swiftly by military aggression by the forces of Kiev against these populations, which are not separatists, that was too often announced in the media, but which were autonomous and wanted their autonomy to be recognized within the Ukrainian borders, and especially the free use of their language, which is Russian. But they were, of course, immediately countered by the power in Kiev, which wanted to have them fall in line again. I think that what is happening in the United States in terms of domestic politics has played an important role. The setbacks of Joe Biden since he was elected president, the catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan, and the great budgetary problems and sequesters have led to a toughening of the American policy orientations that caused the war. I also cannot forget the Ukrainian responsibility especially, of course, the attitude towards the Donbass, but also the very provocative speech that Zelensky finally gave at the Munich summit at the beginning of the year, stating loudly and clearly that for him it was essential that three conditions to be met. First, integration into NATO, which he has never ceased to demand, to the taker of the Donbass by force, and three, the claim to be able to dispose and possess nuclear weapons. When we put all this together, we can only understand, but understanding does not mean excusing, of course, the Russian reaction in relation to all these attitudes that were unfortunately orchestrated against her. I think we should also remember that Putin has repeatedly stated that the militarization of Ukraine 
and its integration into NATO was an existential threat to Russia. We have to take this into account. We have continued to push. We have not taken this into account. We have continued to push the Ukrainians into an extremely tough position toward Moscow and towards the Donbass. Unfortunately, we have obtained exactly what we have provoked and that what was triggered in the Russian offensive. This Russian offensive is a trap in which Putin has accepted to fall, fully aware of it. I would say that he did it all the more willingly because none of his proposals to set up a new security architecture in Europe were honored. Secondly, what what has this conflict been all about since February 24? I would say, first of all, that this is the end of a war. This is finally a war that Ukraine cannot win. First of all, even if we are opposed to this Russian attack, we must recognize that this is a special operation and not a desire to invade Ukraine, as has been said too often by the countries of Eastern Europe and by NATO. Let us first recall the number of troops. 150,000 men took part of, in the Russian operation. By way of comparison, the illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003 by the Americans and the British included 250,000 Americans and 30,000 British, totaling 280,000 troops against an army that was not one-tenth of the efficiency of the Ukrainian army. So to continue to say that Putin wants to invade Ukraine is something absolutely false. This military operation has encountered a number of initial failures and dysfunctions, but for a moment it seems that the war aims that Russia has set itself, that is, to protect the Donbass and finally take over the Russian-speaking provinces, certainly less Russian-speaking than Donetsk and Lugansk in southern Ukraine, is succeeding. Unfortunately, there have been a lot of hasty judgment about the military operation, which, despite the losses on both sides, is not the route that people want us to believe about the Russian army. And this will be part of the important lessons we will find out. Other elements deserve to be mentioned. The massive distribution of arms, in particular of light weapons, anti-tank missiles, and anti-aircraft missiles, which were made by the West Ukraine, if they were partly and even largely used in the conflict, also will feed mafia networks, criminal networks, to be resold to terrorist networks of the third world countries because they, they were carried out without any control. I will also insist on two other points, the reactions and sanctions that have been voted against Russia, which, although they obviously have an international legal basis, have been totally disproportionate, both in their economic and in their cultural aspects. We have reached the height of stupidity by forbidding sportsmen, musicians, and opera singers to practice their profession, whether they are for or against Putin. We have never we have entered into a totalitarianism of thought, which is totally excessive. The same is true of the media. For the first time, the information war that we have launched against Russia is finally characterized by an attack on the freedom of the press. And in the end, the fact of not having information on what's happening on the other side does not allow us to have an objective vision of the situation. I will also conclude by insisting on the role played by Zelensky and his spin doctors today by offering his version of the facts of the Ukrainian conflict. If, of course, this country is being attacked, if it is legitimate of Ukrainians to take up arms to defend themselves, I believe it is essential to report that 90% of the fighting is taking place today in Russian-speaking areas. So it is not the ethnic Ukrainians, it is the Galicians which are suffering from this fighting. However, it is all these ethnic Ukrainians which are leaving the country. Uh, Russian-speaking areas see no immigration. That's it. And at the same time, the western part of the country, which is under Russian bombings, is, in the literal sense, is not a conflict zone. The last point that seems to be important to me is in this conflict is to talk about the co-belligerence of the West because the way in which we supply arms, ammunition and help the Ukrainians with intelligence is no longer indirect aid. It means that we are today in a situation of direct co-belligerence. It has nothing to do with what happened in 1979-89 in Afghanistan where the role we played against Moscow at that time was clandestine aid. It has nothing to do with the support during the Iran, Iraq war, Iran, Iraq war, where the West and France in particular clearly sided with Iraq. 
Today, we are really in a situation of co-belligerence and not only in that of supply arms. I will end with a quick third point. Is a way out of the crisis possible? Today, among the lessons we can draw from these crises and events, first of all, there stand what I would call the victory of geopolitics. Of geopolitics. I explain. I believe that we must say this loud and clear. The lesson of geopolitics here is that no state can ensure its security at the expense of its neighbor. And here, Ukraine has done exactly the opposite, thinking that it could advance its interests by making a mockery of the Russian warnings and demands, which may have been excessive at times, but which were absolutely not taken into account. Beyond that, there were a number of winners and losers in this conflict. Russia and the United States today are partial winners. The Americans, because they have succeeded through this crisis in finally restoring somewhat their image and, above all, in forcing the Europeans to close ranks around them and around NATO. So it's a victory, of course, but there are still major impacts on American policy, especially at the international level, because few people outside the West support the position of the Europeans and Americans, and especially because there are economic consequences, especially inflation hitting the United States. On the Russian side, it is also a form of victory because the Russians managed to show that they can finally challenge the West, even if they are also a series of negative consequences for them, including on the economic level. But in any case, they have not given in from their point of view, and they are arriving at the form of new division of the world in which the West no longer, no longer holds the reins. And then there are the actors who are losing from this conflict. First of all, the Ukrainians, with the total destruction of the country, but also, and I insist on this point, this is a fact for which the Zelensky government is largely responsible. And then the Europeans, the Europeans who blindly follow the Americans into this conflict that does not concern them, because we must remember that Ukraine was neither a member of the European Union nor a member of NATO. It had no defense agreement with the countries of the West, especially not with France. While for us Europeans, the economic sanctions are much, much heavier in terms of consequences than they are for the Americans. So to sum it up, this is a conflict that should, should have been avoided, and there the European responsibility is overwhelming. It should be remembered that if France and Germany, which were major players at the Minsk agreements, had forced Ukraine to respect these Minsk agreements, perhaps the conflict could have been avoided. But of course, the interference of the United States, which was not a party to the Minsk agreements, played a major role. So a conflict that should have been avoided, a war that cannot be won by Ukraine, I think it's necessary to say that very clearly, and unfortunately a way out of the crisis that is not taking shape because of the rise of the extremes, the obstinacy of the Americans, the following of the Europeans, and the Russian attitude that considered that is an existential conflict for Moscow. Do not give me hope for something positive unless there is a 180 degree turnaround of one or the other actors. I believe that this is what we must hope for in the coming weeks. Henry Kissinger's recent statement declaring that it was imperative that Ukraine give up land to Russia seems to me extremely relevant, but the Ukrainian government's stubborn refusal to do so does not allow me to believe that negotiations are possible. Thank you for your attention. And thank you very much, Mr. Denisse. It was Eric Denisse, director of the French Center on Intelligence Researches, and I believe he's with us. Uh, if we can bring him up here for a moment. I want to thank you for being with us. We understand you have some uh, limitations on schedule. And, and so we wanted to take the opportunity, though, while you were here, to get your response to something, partially because of some of the questions that have come in, but also because this is a kind of statement that uh, we'd like to have you respond to. Uh, and we'll put this up. This, there's a passage uh, from the earlier document that Lyndon LaRouche wrote in which he's talked about NATO, and I wanted to get your response to this. He said, NATO has not been a transatlantic alliance, but has been, in fact, a form of Anglo-American political rule over continental Western Europe. This was understood by President Charles de Gaulle, who withdrew France from NATO while preserving France's alliance with the United States on that account. It was for the same reason that de Gaulle blocked Britain's entry into the EEC and enjoyed support from his ally, West Germany's Conrad Adenauer. Uh, and it is Washington and NATO which run NATO, 
Washington and London, which run NATO with other members' nations, degraded to a very, very junior partner status in matters of policy making. What we wanted to do is just get your response to that statement, also because in America, people don't have uh, now particularly any idea about the any difference in terms of de Gaulle's role, France, or any of that. But just wanted to see uh, what your view was of that uh, that idea. Faut ouvrir votre micro, Monsieur Denessé. Okay, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I, I'm very sorry because I had at the same time the French translation and your and your voice, so I didn't hear anything about your question. And I'm also really sorry because I have to leave the conference very quickly. Okay, I so would like just. I can do. I can just yes. give you a sense of it. What we were taught, what, okay. what it referred to is uh, France, de Gaulle's role in terms of his view of NATO and the problem of the dominance by, by Washington and London of that alliance in the junior partner status of Europe. That was what it was. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I see. Uh, of course, the, 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 the the policy of General de Gaulle is, uh, is something we, in France, we would like to. Uh, to apply, uh, but uh, we don't dream. We, I, I don't think that uh, the, the French political leaders today uh, are uh, on the same line as President de Gaulle. Most of them are what we call here Europeans. It means that uh, most of them are fully in the, in the position uh, in which they believe that the, the European Union is the only solution for the future of France. So uh, it's something which is very different uh, uh, from the policy of General de Gaulle. Anyway, I would like to, to, ask, to add something which, in my opinion, is very important. I remember at the end of the Cold War, I had the occasion to meet uh, Colonel Prélin. Prélin was the, the former instructor of Vladimir Putin at the head of the KGB. And uh, he told me something very interesting, which, in my opinion, is very important to understand what happened in Ukraine today. He said, we are not the gems of World War II. We did not lose the war. The USSR collapsed, but Russia did not lose the war. Don't make the mistake of treating us as defeated. But I'm sorry, this is what we did. So from the beginning, I mean, from 90, 1991, at the very end of the Cold War, we begin to do a lot of mistakes and step by step, uh, year by year, we have been digging and digging the, the number of mistakes that uh, us, I mean, the French, the European and the American uh, have been doing uh, regarding Russia. Uh, it's a pity because uh, as a former intelligence officer of the Cold War, I don't have any love or hate about Russia, but I have to, con uh, to confess that the lot of mistake we have been doing is the real uh, reason of the war that we are living today. Thank you, and thank you very much for joining us today. We understand you have a limited amount of time, but you handled the question as well as you could have, and we thank you for your remarks. All right, thank you. Uh, so now we're going to go to our final speaker, who is Ray McGovern, analyst for Central Intelligence Agency, retired, founding member of the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, somebody that people have seen here many, many times. I want to thank Ray both for his patience today and also for his presence today and inform him that uh, he's in for the, uh, do the distinction of uh, uh, being be besieged with many questions which have come in, uh, which we'll be getting to. So, Ray, glad to see you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. Okay, good. Well, thanks for the warning. I'll have to be careful with what I say, <laughs> the questions. Um, I'm going to start on a certain, a, a different note, uh, keeping in tune with the, the French uh, aspect of this. I'm going to quote from, uh, from World War II French war hero, Antoine d'Exupéry, who wrote this little novella, uh, Le Petit Prince, uh, the, the Little Prince. Uh, I don't want to misquote him, and, and so I'm going to read what the meaning of what he said, how he presented it. He said, the main, the, the main theme of The Little Prince is the importance of looking beneath the surface to find the real truth and the real meaning of a thing. It is the fox 
who teaches the prince to see with one's heart instead of just with one's eyes. Unfortunately, says the author, most adults have trouble doing this. <laughs> well, we've talked a little bit about insanity here, right? Uh, Colonel Black asks, have we all gone mad? A very legitimate question, given the nuclear aspect of all this stuff. Let me just address that very briefly by saying that Colonel Black was one of the main signers, one of 21, uh, who signed our Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity Memorandum to President Biden on 1 May. And, and what we said was mirrored just one week later by the head of the CIA and by the National Intelligence Director before the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, Averill Haynes, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, said to Senator, I guess, Senator Warner from Virginia, she said, now, Senator, uh, we don't want nuclear war. We think that one of the main things that might prompt nuclear war is if Putin feels that he is about to be defeated in Ukraine. Now, she's an intelligence director. She doesn't make the policy. <laughs> but the policy clearly should be, hello, let's not make Putin perceive that he's going to be defeated in Ukraine. Otherwise, he may use nuclear weapons. I mean, anyhow, but the policy is different, isn't it? The policy is, therefore, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and many other politicians, therefore, we want total victory, as has already been said. We want total defeat for Putin. Doesn't make any sense. The author is right in saying adults really have difficulty understanding what this all means beneath the surface. Um, I keep asking myself why it is that President Biden felt it necessary, oh, I think it was about six weeks after he took office, to, to address the Chinese challenge, right? And what he said was something equivalent to China is trying to become the most powerful country in the world economically and, and uh, militarily. That's not going to happen on my watch. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Are the Chinese aggressively oriented? Not if you know anything about Chinese civilization for the last several millennia. Do they have a lot of work to do right in their own country? They sure do, and they're doing it well. Uh, so the Chinese have this bizarre concept that you can have a win-win a situation. You know, like both sides, like we used to say, can't we just get along? <laughs> well, there's a long story behind that, of course. Uh, we need an enemy if we want to feed the, the defense contractors and have them feed our politicians and have them appropriate more money for, well, so you know that story. In any case, you know, if you look deeper, if you look under the surface, why not? Why not a win-win situation? Now, Vladimir Putin put it a little differently. Uh, some of you may remember, because it was just nine years ago, uh, that we were on the verge of war against Syria, open war, tomahawk missiles, and that kind of thing, okay? Who bailed Obama out? Well, the fellow's name happened to be Vladimir Putin. What did he say? He said, we know you guys are accusing Bashar al-Assad, pre president of, of Syria, uh, for uh, launching a chemical attack outside Damascus. We don't think that's right. We think you've been mousetrapped, but nevertheless, we've done a deal with the Syrians We've agreed with them to load up all their chemical weapons uh, under UN supervision and have them destroyed, if you'll allow it, on one of your warships, specifically um, outfitted to destroy chemical weapons. And Obama said, really? Because Kerry didn't tell him about that. But they were working on it. And the reason I mention all that is because that was the zenith 
that was the high point of relations between the United States of America and Russia over recent decades. What happened? Well, Putin wrote a, my God, did he write? Yeah, he actually wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. The date was 12 September, 2003, print edition. And what did he say? Well, he addressed this win-win. He addressed this, why can't we get along? Uh, because he saw it was coming because of what Obama had just said in the major speech. Here's Putin writing in the New York Times. We can avoid force in Syria, and this will improve the atmosphere in international relations and strengthen mutual trust. Quote, my working and personal relationship with President Obama is marked by growing trust. I appreciate this. I would rather disagree with a case he made on American exceptionalism, stating that the United States policy is what makes America different. It makes us exceptional. It's extremely dangerous to encourage people to see themselves as exceptional. The big countries, small countries, rich and poor, those with long democratic traditions, and those still finding their way to democracy. Their policies differ too. We are all different. But when we ask for God's blessings, we must not forget that God created us equal. God created us equal. Does that ring any bells? In other words, what Putin is saying is, look, uh, you, Mr. President, brag about being exceptional. You need to know, even in this very conciliatory, hopeful op-ed, I don't agree. I think all nations are the same in terms of whether they're exceptional or not. And you should know that right off the bat. Now, one little token of that comes to mind. That is, uh, it's dearly good after every speech to say, God bless the United States of America. Huh, that's interesting, isn't it? There's nothing in Judeo-Christian biblical literature that allows anyone, even the President of the United States, to use the imperative voice with God. God, you bless the United States of America. The rest of the people, well, that's at your discretion, but you bless. Hear it, God? Bless the United States of America. I mean, here's <laughs> a little symptom of what we're up against. Now, there is another way. And I don't know if uh, many of uh, our viewers here know Kirk. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, the novelist, but uh, he was a, the supreme humanist, agnostic, and yet he was very, very clear in pointing to a, a different way of doing things. You should, re, you should know that uh, Kurt was in the 106th Infantry Division during the Battle of the Bulge, was captured by the Germans, taken to taken to a German city, Dresden, yeah, Dresden, just before all those incendiary bombings uh, that took place, U.S. Air Force, Britain. And he hid out in a meat locker during those uh, bombings with the other POWs. And when they could come out into the open, uh, the task fell to them to disinter all the bodies, copious corpses, and then reinter them if they could find a piece of grass uh, beneath the rubble. Why do I say all this? I say all this because Vonnegut knew humanity at its worst. He knew he was there. He watched people do those kinds of things to other people. Now, years later, uh, someone asked Vonnegut, and once again, I would, I would uh, emphasize that he was a uh, humanist. So, uh, you know, that means an agnostic. He said, well, uh, Kirk, uh, Kirk uh, what do you think of, <clears throat> of Jesus of Nazareth? 
Again, I don't want to misquote him. This is what he said. I say of, of Jesus, as all humanists do, if what he said is good, and so much of it is absolutely beautiful, what does it matter if he was God or not? If Jesus hadn't delivered the Sermon on the Mount with its message of mercy and pity, I wouldn't want to be a human being. I'd just as soon be a cockroach. Kurt Vonnegut. Just as soon be a cockroach. Well, he referred to, he referred to the Sermon on the Mount here, and uh, I looked it up again uh, just this morning. I'd like to just cite like four of the eight so-called Beatitudes and kind of expatiate on why they might not apply to this situation and how far away American exceptionalism is in relation to these Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek. Hmm. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Hmm, justice, wow. Justice means everybody's equal, right? Um, no exceptions. <laughs> no exceptions and no exceptionalism. <laughs> if I read that right, okay. Blessed are the peacemakers. Hmm. This is, get this one, this is the last one. Blessed are you when people insult you, slander you, persecute you. Uh, be glad about that. You're in good company. That's exactly what they did to the earlier prophets. That's easier said than done, but I think we need to do that. We need to keep doing that. And there's a, a typical American trait that I've run into where people are reluctant to do something that they might not be successful in, you know? In other words, who wants to be laughed at? Who wants to go out and do something on principle and then have people say, Ray, what did you think you were doing by, by uh, turning your back on, on a, a warmonger uh, political figure? So there's this natural reluctance not to do things that our heart underneath the surface would prompt us to do. And one of my prophets is uh, Daniel Berrigan, who would have been 101 just last month. And, and what he said was, look, you know, after we did that action in outside of Baltimore, uh, burning draft cards, uh, we were in the only uh, federal office building in this small little town, it was a, a post office. And we're sitting around and I'm thinking to myself, whoa, this was a big action. Uh, was it worth doing? Uh, were we crazy? That's what everyone will say. Um, were we just trying to grab attention or what was it worth doing? And then says Daniel Berrigan, it occurred to me, look, Dan, <laughs> the good is worth doing because it's good. Now, results are, are not unimportant, but they're secondary to the goodness of the act. You gotta ha go ahead and do it, okay? Now, Dan Berrigan was not only a, a courageous person, he was a poet. And it was also, he had a great sense of humor. And I cite this because doing this work, uh, you're gonna be disappointed. You're gonna need to have a good sense of humor. And as Dan relates what happened next, after he had come to this insight in, the, uh, in, in this little small post office, there were about eight of them there. And his brother, Phil, was in his clerics. You know, he's all dressed up in his uh, clerics, Roman collar and all. And as Dan ex ex expresses it, he says, well, just then, portentously, the door swings open 
and in comes a paradigm of an FBI inspector. And he looks around the room and he sees my brother Phil and he says, Oh, you again! <laughs> I'm going to change my religion! <laughs> and, and Dan Wright said, No higher compliment could come to my brother Phil. <laughs> okay. So you got to keep a light sense here during these tough times. And you've got to remember that, you know, when we talk about rules based order, some sort of substitute for the UN or Westphalia, for God's sake, the rules based order, well, there's one rule that's more important than all the others. The greatest of these is love. Helga mentioned this. We need to all remember that deep down underneath, we need to understand these other people. We need to try in a gentle way, as gently as we can, to disabuse themselves of the notion that they are exceptional, that they can, well, rule the rest of the world. It's not going to happen anyway, but the sooner we all realize that, the better I'm talking about we Americans, of course. I'd like to close with, with two things, and, and that is a little quote from Théard de Chardin. Quote, The day will come when, after harnessing the winds, the tides, and gravity, we shall harness the energies of love. We shall harness the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, man will have discovered fire. This comes from his book, Fire of Love. And in finishing, I just simply need to cite Friedrich Schiller, uh, under whose name this institute uh, exists. And uh, some of you will recognize the words because uh, Beethoven, decided he would steal them as well. They are alle Menschen werden Brüder und Schwestern. All men are brothers and sisters. Uh, we can get through this, just have to remember that. And remember that of all the rules-based orders, the greatest of these is love. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for staying with us and participating as people have. There have been many questions, and what we'd like to do is bring up our panel as a whole, um, which I think at this point is Helga, Colonel Black, and Ray. Yes, it is. All right, so Helga, you see your friends here. Uh, would you go ahead and <laughs> give us any kind of response that you'd like to as to what you've heard as a whole first? Well, I think we should get the message out as quickly as possible to as many people because it is quite significant that the people with military background are against the war and the politicians are the reckless ones, uh, you know, risking the existence of civilization. So that's my most important comment and I'm very happy that Ray picked up on my last thought because I think you know if there's not an emotional change um, then the danger is that this goes completely wrong um, I mean I'm really horrified when I see how gleichgeschaltet the media and the official politicians mainstream politicians are at least as far as I can see it in Germany and uh, English speaking media uh, the hatred has taken over. <clears throat> and I think that has to be indeed replaced with love. And that is not, you know, not some romantic idea, but it is the question of, you know, are we human or not? And, um, you know, human beings are capable of creative reason and therefore we should be able to find a solution. Now, I know that what we are proposing in terms of the solution, the international security architecture, including Russia and China, <clears throat> sounds like very far away from what is possible right now. But, you know, I think that in my view, it's not enough to have a European security architecture. 
uh, I think it does have to, it has to involve the United States and China and the United States and Russia, because I think that anything less than that is not going to work. And that does require a change in attitude. Okay. Um, we have a lot of questions, and what I'd like to do is, uh, I know Senator Black, uh, uh, Senator Black, you may have something to say in addition, um, but there's a question for you, but I, so I'd like to start us off with that. Um, and the questioner is Jeff Young, and he says, I found your bio in this paragraph. Uh, before he retired from the U.S. military in 1994, Colonel Black headed the Army's Criminal Law Division at the Pentagon developed executive orders for the president's signature uh, and laws that were enacted by Congress. He advised senior government officials on issues of national significance and testified before the U.S. Congress representing the U.S. Army on four occasions. So now here's then the body of his question. The Bush-Cheney administration in invaded Iraq in 2003. Many experts in international law have concluded that that invasion constituted international aggression, and I agree with them. If you had still been the head of the Army's Criminal Law Division in 2002 and 2003, would you have advised your superior officers, Vice President Cheney and President George W. Bush, that their long-planned invasion of Iraq would be totally illegal from day one? The reason I ask this is because it's clear to me that Russia's special military operation in Ukraine today does not constitute an illegal invasion or international aggression because Russia was acting in self-defense and collective self-defense, see Article 51 of the UN Charter. Okay, so that is his, uh, what he poses to you, Colonel Black. Your response? Yeah, let me, let me just say, uh, uh, it's a very good question. Um, it is my impression that uh, our war against Iraq uh, was a war of aggression. Uh, there was no foundation for it. And I think over the years, the facts have come out that uh, this business about sarin gas was a pretext. There seems to be a, uh, a page in the, in the CIA manual that says if you want to establish a pretext for war, make it, make it sarin gas. It's kind of, it's, it's odorless, it's colorless. Uh, uh, you can you can claim it even if it's never been used, um, but uh, we we had no basis for going in there. You know what's amazing? We talk about uh, that it's just criminal that uh, Russia has has fought in this urban combat, which inevitably means blowing down buildings and so forth. And we said, well, blowing down the buildings that's a war crime. Um, People so easily forget uh, what we used to call shock and awe. Shock and awe was when we would go in and we would massively bomb and we would destroy the entire electrical grid, the water supply, the food distribution, the, the transportation networks. Everything that was required for human life was destroyed by shock and awe. And in fact, to this very day, now we've been, we've been fighting in Iraq for 30, 30 years, 31 years now. And uh, uh, the electrical system that we destroyed when we attacked back then has never been fully restored. Uh, Saddam Hussein ran a very fine electrical system, but we have never been able to replace it because we really, we could care less about the people of Iraq. Um, so, yeah, you compare, you compare the situation with, uh, with uh, Russia and Ukraine. Clearly, Ukraine entering into NATO was an existential threat to Russia because uh, once they were a member of, of NATO, any conflict right on the border with Russia would trigger the, uh, the provisions of, of the NATO defensive alliance and would have brought the entire world into war. Uh, and here, here you have uh, one of the most corrupt nations in the world, um, Ukraine, and suddenly they would have the power to light the nuclear torch. Um, so the, Russia could not afford that. 
And in many ways, they were in precisely the situation that we faced during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was a boy back then. I, was, I, was, I hunted snakes in the Florida Everglades, which was very remote back in those days. And it was early in the morning uh, during, during the height of the, the uh, uh, crisis. And I was driving uh, through the Everglades on Route 27. Now, Florida is not a very military state. And uh, all of a sudden, coming over the horizon was the greatest convoy of military vehicles I have ever seen in my life, including 32 years in the military. It was gargantuan. And the U.S. was moving forces down to South Florida to prepare for an invasion of Cuba. At that time and today, looking back, I think we were fully justified in invasion of Cuba had it been necessary. Uh, why? Because Cuba presented a, a serious threat, a nuclear threat on our border. We could not allow that. Why can't we understand that Russia cannot accept a much closer nuclear threat on its border? Cuba, after all, was 90 miles by sea. Uh, the Ukrainian border is right on the border of Russia. They cannot accept a nuclear-powered NATO member Ukraine. It simply must not happen. And I think what we need to do ultimately, we need to look to the uh, Austrian solution. During the Cold War, there was a treaty signed in 1955 and the, the post-World War II powers, the Soviet Union, US, UK, France, they all agreed that they would remove all of their troops from Austria and in exchange, Austria would modify its constitution and it would say two things. First, that Ukraine would be a neutral, non-belligerent nation for eternity. Number two, that uh, the Ukrainian constitution would prohibit the stationing of any foreign troops on, on Austrian soil. Uh, Austria, as a consequence of this treaty, was this island of tranquility at the height of the Cold War, where we had thousands of tanks and missiles, artillery pieces. I was part of NATO back then. I remember it very well. We were poised for, for an invasion at the, at the Fulda Gap. And, uh, and meanwhile, I managed to go into Austria and, and I attended the Chris Crindle Mart and people were celebrating Christmas and the birth of Christ and their lights and their candles and, and people are joyous and happy. And meanwhile, everywhere on the, on the Iron Curtain, People are tense and faced off with bayonets and, and artillery pieces. That type of solution is what we need to impose in, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, now at this point, I think realistically, Russia is not going to give up the territory that they have acquired in very, very difficult fighting. But I think we're going to have to recognize that these Russian speaking areas will now become a part of Russia. But at the same time, um, there need to be guarantees. I think perhaps the guarantees could could guarantee uh, Ukraine that uh, that Russia would not take over the port of Odessa so that they would have the ability to move their their freight through the uh, through the Black Sea. There are solutions and we better start talking about them now and stop talking about escalating towards nuclear war. Thank you, Colonel Biden. Um, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go uh, right to you with something. First, there's sort of a comment from one individual who didn't wanna give their name and then there's a question uh, which, uh, and which is attributed. So the the um, comment was, I can relate to everything being said, but for one thing, you have talked about a Russian war of aggression. This, of course, was, I think, more for the Italian uh, uh, Air Force uh, officer. 
The war of aggression was started by the Ukrainian government against the population in eastern Ukraine in 2014. The Ukrainian government fought a war of aggression for eight years. For eight years, the Russians demanded that Ukraine stop the war or Russia would have to intervene militarily to protect that population. For eight years, the Ukrainians ignored the Russian demands and warnings. For eight years, Ukraine was not sanctioned by Western governments, and the population didn't get help. They got no medical aid, no food, no relief, no money, and it goes on. So that was the comment. Uh, the next, the question is from Reverend Jack Dunyon, and I directed in your direction, Ray, but others may have something to say about it. He says, uh, there are some 4,000 lobbyist groups in the United States associated with the military industrial complex, a complexity that Eisenhower warned about before leaving the office of president. Isn't the expansion of NATO and the need for it to spend 2% of GDP on, mili- on their military a product of these lobbyist groups? So I thought uh, this is Reverend Jack Dunyon, and it might give you, Ray, a chance to tell him a bit about your view of these matters. Sure. Uh, actually, I can present my acronym, <laughs> the Mickey Mat. It sort of rhymes with the Mickey Mouse, M-I-C-M-A-T-T. It's the Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Academia Think Tank Complex. Now, I just note that Think Tank, uh, we have bookings coming out now uh, in a way to support what Biden is doing in the most warlike way. So what do I mean? I mean that since the Eisenhower warning of over 60 years ago now, uh, his MIC, his military industrial complex, has expanded. Now it's the military industrial congressional intelligence media academia think tank complex. Why do I say media as if in all caps? Because media is the linchpin. Without the media, you can't make it work. So obviously you need a you need an enemy. I mean, hello, a piece is very bad for the military industrial complex. Uh, China is supposed to be number one, but for the nonce, uh, Russia will do quite well. Thank you very much. People are making money hand over fist. Raytheon and Lockheed are writing to their shareholders saying, man, the tension in Ukraine, and this is a direct quote, is very good for business. So uh, the questioner, of course, is right on target. It is the military industrial complex that is responsible for taking more than 50, 55% of our discretionary tax money and putting it into wild ideas like F-35s, that really don't work all that well. So yeah, that's the main. Let me just uh, add uh, something in addition to what my good friend, Colonel Black has said. He's quite right, of course, about the the phony intelligence that was ginned up to justify the war in Iraq. A five-year study done by the Senate and a bipartisan conclusions indicated that the intelligence used was uncorroborated, contradicted, or non-existent. Wait a second. What does non-existent intelligence look like? Uh, I think it means made made up stuff. A bipartisan five-year investigation by the Senate Intelligence Committee. So, you know, the, the big distinction here, and I'm so glad that Colonel Black raised it, is between Cuba, where we had an existential threat to the United States, and Iraq, and Afghanistan, and Libya, and Somalia, you name them. Are you telling me any of those countries were, or are, or all of them together would be as an existential threat to the United States? No. Cuba was. Now, one extra point to add to what Colonel Black said. We were very proud. Uh, we intelligence analysts that having discovered the missiles in Cuba, and we said, Mr. President, here are some images. Those are the missiles. And he said, well, are they armed? And we said, well, um, we assessed, we assess that they're not armed. 
Now, Kennedy was too polite a person to say, what the, what the hell does we assess mean? <laughs> and so we got off the hook. Guess what? Some of you may know, they were armed. They were ready to fire. We didn't know that until 30 years later, okay? So what am I saying here? I'm saying that Colonel Black is exactly right in as much as he, he portrays the situation facing Vladimir Putin, okay? Now, there are missile sites in place already in Romania, near the Russian border, and almost complete in Poland, near the Russian border, okay? Now, they are said to be ABM sites, anti-ballistic missile sites. But we know, Putin knows, he's actually said this explicitly, we know what the plans are. They can be, they can be used for what Putin calls Tomagok, Tomagok. Um, th there's no H in, in Russian, uh, Tomahawk missiles, okay? And later, hypersonic missiles flying eight or nine times the speed of sound. Okay, now, you're Putin, and you're looking at these things, and you know that these anti-ballistic missile systems can be changed by slipping in a disc overnight to firing offensive strike missiles that can hit not only Moscow, but a, a good share of Russia's ICBM force. And you're saying, whoa, how many minutes do I have to decide whether I should destroy the rest of the world? Now, if you're a responsible leader, those are the kinds of questions you ask, right? And he's told, well, maybe, maybe nine minutes. Uh, if they're hypersonic, five to seven minutes. Now, <laughs> that ain't enough time. And so what is the inevitable result? You automate these systems. You let some NCO down in, in the, the ranks decide, whoops, that looks like a missile going up there near Norway. Looks like a U.S. missile. In reality, it's a, uh, it's a scientific research uh, uh, rocket, okay? You know, my orders are to fire. I, Putin doesn't have a chance. It doesn't have any time to make. I ha the, the decision has devolved to me. Maybe I ought to check with my lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant colonel, fire. That's the end of us, okay? So <laughs> what Putin is trying to do is very sensible. I'll add one other thing that really baffles me. Did the President of the United States promise Putin that he would not put offensive strike missiles in Ukraine? The Russians say he did. Nobody on the US side acknowledges that he did. Very briefly, on December 7th last year, Biden and Putin talked by telephone. And Putin and Biden said, okay, we're gonna set up this negotiating process. Biden, to his credit, uh, heeded the note that, you know, this is somewhat urgent. We'll, we'll do it on the, on the 12th of September. That's when we'll start. I mean, that December. On the 12th of, what are we talking here? Uh, yeah, we're gonna do it 12th of January. 2022. Okay. Then all of a sudden, Moscow makes it known that Putin needs to talk to, to, to Biden right away at, before the end of the year. And so they talk on the 20th of December, I'm sorry, on the 30th of December, talk by telephone. Now, we don't know from the US side what was discussed. But the Russians had a readout and they said, Joseph Biden, the president of the United States said, the United States has no intention of putting offensive strike missiles in Ukraine, period, end quote. There was rejoicing in Moscow. There was a lot of publicity to the, uh, Putin's main, main aides made a big thing out of this. What did the US do? Well, you won't find much mention of this at all. I haven't even checked, you know, I've not seen anything in the Times or the Washington Post, and there was nothing in the U.S. readout. Now, did the U.S. say, no, no, you got that wrong? Oh, no, the, the Russian readout is erroneous? 
No, they didn't. So I'm left as an analyst to say, wow, Biden, one to one, personally, on the telephone with Putin, promised to do something. And then it, oh, it slipped through the cracks. Or then he woke up the next morning, Biden did. And his advice said, Joe, <laughs> yeah, I'd say, you can, that's a, those are big high cards we have in our in our hand there. You can't promise not to put offensive missiles in, in Ukraine. Now, all I know is that happened, okay? All I know is that Russian readouts are almost always accurate on such things. And I know also that it was not disputed by anybody else. So what happened to it? Now, all I can say is if I'm Vladimir Putin, I'm saying, whoa, 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 the president of the United States can promise me something personally, one-on-one, -on -one, and then apparently uh, he goes back on his promise or he figures he can't really do this because of the forces, the hostile, the, uh, the, the inner uh, circle, his domestic politics won't allow him to do it. So how can I trust Joe Biden? That has to be addressed. And uh, all I'm saying is that uh, this was a real, real existential problem. And uh, I have my own experience with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, that's why I look a little older than Colonel Black. I was in uniform at the time, and I could tell you how there were no weapons at Fort Benning, Georgia, because they were all down in Key West. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ray. I wanted to go right back to Helga because we we have limited limited time, but Helga, there there were several there's several questions which all sort of converge upon your view, and also this issue of Europe and the United States. I mean, some are talking about the question of American exceptionalism and what Europe can do about that problem. Some things are just the question about the issue of nuclear war and the problem of. Uh, the commitments made because of the Green New Deal. There's several different small questions like that. Uh, but I just also wanted to see if you had any reaction or any response to what uh, Ray was just saying and Colonel Black earlier. Well, I, I would hope that, you know, an Austrian solution kind of uh, outcome would be possible. Right now, you know, this talk about uh, that Putin cannot be allowed to win, uh, meaning, you know, that the West has to uh, uh, the West has to win over Russia. The, in the best case, that would mean to fight until the last Ukrainian, and the Ukrainian people would be just completely, you know, uh, absolutely, you know, smashed and 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 the victims of this whole thing. But, you know, I have a, another question or another concern, and that is that even if one gets a negotiated solution for Ukraine, which I think is absolutely necessary, there must be a ceasefire right away, um, then, you know, everything else can be uh, negotiated, you know, territorial questions, other questions. But even if that would succeed, we are not out of the tr trouble because, you know, the intention of, the NATO and the United States and global Britain, and unfortunately, to a certain extent, such people like von der Leyen in the EU, they are determined to um, make sure that China is not rising. I mean, if you look at all the activity, Blinken running around in, in Asia, Biden is now in Asia, von der Leyen was in India. I mean, there's, there will be a huge uh, NATO summit in June uh, in Madrid, uh, which will discuss a new NATO strategy, global NATO. Um, <clears throat> the, the aim of all of this is to, to prevent the rise of China, to contain and encircle not only Russia, but, but also China, to prevent other nations of lining up with these two who have now a big strategic alliance, which is not functioning because, you know, many countries like even Brazil under Bolsonaro doesn't doesn't uh, take a position anti-Russia. Argentina, Indonesia, India, uh, Thailand, um, uh, Nigeria, Egypt, all of these countries go back to their non-aligned tradition. So, you know, the problem is not solved in just ending the Ukrainian war because the 
effort to contain Russia and China would remain. Uh, furthermore, uh, we are still in a hyperinflationary blowout of the financial system, which is the real locomotive for the war danger, because you know that is that is what motivates these people. Because rather than reforming and recognizing that the neoliberal system is finished, they rather go to war. And therefore, as long as you don't address the underlying reason, which is the collapse of the financial system, I don't think there will be a solution. Now, I, <clears throat> I absolutely think that what, what I have said in terms of the international security architecture and development architecture is the only way. And that brings naturally the big question of, you know, is there any hope to get the United States to change their course, to take up the offers of Xi Jinping, uh, of a win-win cooperation. I mean, Xi Jinping has made two very important initiatives in the recent weeks, which absolutely are echoing what we are saying. Namely, he has put on the table a global development initiative, which is a plan to overcome poverty worldwide in cooperation with all these countries and a global security initiative. And uh, some Chinese, had, yesterday we had a forum with Stockholm and Copenhagen where a Chinese speaker basically said that, you know, for the Chinese, there is no peace without development and no development without peace. And therefore these two initiatives have to go together, the global development initiative and the global security initiative. And I, you know, I really think that the United States would gain much more in terms of the real interest of the United States if they would join that. Chas Freeman uh, told us <clears throat> a while ago, <clears throat> let the Chinese build railroads and we put just American cars and American locomotives on the rails which the Chinese build. Let the Chinese build airports. We can use them for our uh, purposes and cooperate. I think that is the direction we have to go. And, you know, <clears throat> I think if the United States military industrial complex and the other entities, you know, some of them are pretty useless, but uh, <clears throat> if they could be convinced that they could earn more money or just be of use and, you know, not have World War Three, if they would join with these uh, initiatives and countries. Now, I know that that is the big question, but I still would like to hear from Ray and uh, Colonel Black what they think at some point. Okay, let's let's ask right now. And uh, there are a couple of other questions, but we can pause for a minute. So, uh, Colonel Black, any thoughts? You know, uh, yeah, let me just add to what Helga has said. I, I think uh, it, it really is very important that we work with Russia, with China, we need to recognize we have a multipolar world. It's, it is emerging. And she is definitely correct that uh, at the heart of, of what drives and what worries all of the deep state actors is the, the uh, instability of the Western financial system today. But let me just point out the illusion of Russian and Chinese aggression around the world. Um, you'll hear this repeated many, many times that, you know, any day, you know, Russia is going to take over the entire world. China's taking over the world. They're doing all this stuff. If you look <clears throat> at the, uh, the number of foreign bases between the US and the UK, we have about 900 overseas military bases, bases where we have troops uh, stationed in foreign countries. The total uh, bases of the, the Russians and the Chinese, about 35, about 35 uh, in total. China only has five overseas bases compared to the 900 or so US, UK. Um, this we've created this bizarre illusion because the deep state, the, the war industrial complex must have enemies. You cannot manufacture weapons when you don't have enemies. 
And so we create this illusion that they're coming to get us, they're, they're on our doorstep. And the fact of the matter is that China is out to make a buck. They want money. Uh, they, yes, they, they, uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is very important, but they have a different paradigm. Our paradigm is we, we go into a country, we set up uh, NGOs, uh, we take over, you know, the government by coup. If we can't, then we just we just bomb the place to smithereens half the time. And you compare that with the with the foreign policy of China, which is you go in, you work with whatever government is there. You don't you don't you're not judgmental, but you make hard business decisions. You make investments. And uh, I think for people who are comparing the foreign aid paradigm of, of the US and China, they're saying, you know, uh, my, my, uh, my likelihood of surviving is much higher if I follow the Chinese paradigm. So we, we, need, we need to just get away from this feeling that we have to constantly be at war with the entire world. You know, uh, Great Britain uh, has the, the 21 mile English Channel that se separates it from Europe. And uh, that 21 miles has kept it quite, uh, quite safe from, uh, from invasion over, you know, many, many centuries. Uh, there have been a couple of exceptions and the Vikings came in and different, uh, different things, bigger ones than that. But, but in any event, they're basically safe. 21 miles of ocean. You look at us, we've got 5,000, 6,000 miles of ocean separating us from the nearest threats that we perceive. Um, so we probably have less reason to be militaristic than any great nation on earth. And yet here we are, we, our budget is, uh, the last I checked, it was, it was as large as the next largest 11 defense budgets of the, the biggest defense spenders in the world. So uh, we, we, cut a, we cut a single check uh, to Ukraine uh, that is as big as the entire military budget uh, of, of Russia for a year. So uh, we, need to, we need to escape from this illusion uh, that, that they're out to get us because they're not out to get us there is nothing aggressive either in the policy of China or of Russia. And the only, the only aggression is with the US, UK, the NATO countries, which, you know, I, I, I look at, the, at the, the history of the wars of the Russian Federation. You have the tiny, tiny war in Georgia. You have uh, the war in Syria, which they, they didn't get involved in until four years after the terrorists had been there. And then finally, at the last moment, they agreed to go in at the request of, of Syria because ISIS and Al Qaeda threatened to overwhelm the country. Very reluctant, somewhat limited involvement in Syria. And now you have the situation in Ukraine. You compare that to our situation where we've we fought multiple wars against Iraq. We fought in Somalia, we fought in Bosnia, we fought in Haiti, we fought in Kosovo, Afghanistan, Yemen, Libya, Uganda, Syria. I've probably missed half a dozen wars that, uh, that we fought. We fight everywhere. You can literally have a soldier who retires with 30 years active service in the US Army, and he will retire and never have served a single day when the United States was not invading and occupying some country. So to, to compare that with the situation with, with Russia and China, where has China had fought? Who have they invaded? They've had a couple little border, border disputes, but that's it. They, they don't invade people. We invade people. So we need to get away from this illusion. If we could ever break away from the illusion that they're out to get us, which is totally false, then we could start chopping back on our, 
on our defense budget, world tensions could re reduce, and we could get back to making cell phones or whatever we do for a living and, uh, and have a, a genuine economy that wasn't based on killing people in foreign countries. That's what we ought to do. Okay. Ray? Yeah, I, I would I would agree. Uh, I, I would say that uh, when you go back to the military industrial complex that uh, President Eisenhower warned against, uh, he said there's only one antidote to the accretion of power wanted or unwanted by the MIC, and that is a well-educated citizenry. That's what we lack here in the United States. We do not have a well-educated citizenry. That's why I applaud what we're doing here, uh, trying to get the word out. Uh, we need to keep doing that. And as things turn, as they are now in Ukraine, as Russia consolidates its pincer movement there in southeast Ukraine, uh, people can come to the conclusion that, look, we need to do something about this. We really ought to negotiate and not fight to the last Ukrainian. With respect to nuclear war, you know, I think Biden really, really doesn't want nuclear war. I also think that Biden is not very much in charge. I tried to adduce an example of that before. It doesn't matter what McGovern thinks. It matters what Putin thinks, okay? If you look at Putin looking at Joe Biden, he's asking who's in control of this country anyhow? Biden makes a personal promise to me and all of a sudden it's forgotten. Who has access to the nuclear button? Well, I have to assume the worst here. I have to assume that uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to have a, uh, a situation where if, if the tide turns against us Russians in Ukraine, uh, I'm going to have to do something. Now, what will Putin do? I don't think he'll resort to small nuclear weapons. He'll go to his big brother. There's been a tectonic shift in what the, the old Russians used, the old Soviets used to call the world correlation of forces. <clears throat> uh, people talk about the end of a unipolar world. Well, that's clear. The U.S. is not, not in charge of everything anymore. But then they talk about a multipolar war. Well, I see it as a bipolar war uh, in both senses of, of the word, all right? You have the lily white west, NATO, and then you have China, India, a lot of the Russians are people of color. Uh, the ones that look more like us, most of us, well, they've been blackened so much over the last 10 years that <laughs> they can be considered people of color too. You've got most of the world against the lily white NATO. This is big. This is like a dichotomy that really has to be addressed by more sensi sensi sensible policies. Now, if Putin's back is against the wall, he's going to go to his friend Z, whom he, I believe, told about what he was going to do in Ukraine. Did Z say, oh my God, no, no, you can't do this because our cardinal principle is non-interference in the affairs of other countries. No, no, no. We're, we're the only ones faithful to Vesphalia. No, he didn't. What did he say? I will give you an exemption from Westphalia. Yeah. As long as you're not going to do this before the Olympics, are you? Before the Olympics are over? Now, that's the kind of at least tacit endorsement that the Chinese gave Putin for breaking their fundamental principle stand against interference in the affairs of other countries. Now they, they no longer say that very much. What they say now is we judge every situation on its specific merits, and then we react. They said that to Biden. They said that to the head of the EU. They said that to the head of NATO. It's right there in their statements. We judge these things now based on the specific merits of the situation. So that's what Putin's gonna do first. Now, 
if the Chinese sort of say, well, no, we don't want any part of this, then I think we do have a real chance of uh, the consideration of nuclear weapons. Uh, I don't think it's going to come to that. But if it comes to that, then we really do have to worry because uh, he knows, that is, Putin knows, that our generals and admirals uh, treat, uh, treat this possibility with incredible nonchalance and think that they can perhaps limit a nuclear exchange, which is, again, crazy. Uh, everyone knows that, except apparently some of these generals and admirals. And as long as Biden can keep them in check, which is a real question, then I think we're going to be okay. We'll be able to no negotiate or ask Zelensky to get more sensible and negotiate a way out of this, this situation in Ukraine. Uh, let me ask, colleague, if you have any response to what you've heard them say. If not, I can go on with other questions. I think you should go on with other questions. Even so, I don't think my question was really answered mm. totally. Oh. Okay. Well, there, there'll be plenty of other chances. Uh, I have one for you, uh, Helga. Actually, no, let me do this. There's a general question for everyone, and it may help uh, here. This is someone... Uh, Klaus Wieten is his name, and he's asking about uh, a dangerous circumstance. He says, do you have any further, dear speakers, do you have any further information on the possible Polish peacekeeping mission in Western Ukraine, which is tantamount to a de facto occupation? From my point of view, Zelensky's promise to grant Polish citizens a special status and to allow them to hold political office in Ukraine speaks very much in favor of this future development. Um... Then he goes on, he has some speculations here, which I'll include because they're part of the question. He says, I, I suspect that Russia now will advance as far as Kremenchuk in central Ukraine and the regions or cities of, and he names several, Dnepro, Kharkov, as well as the entire south of the country, including the annexation of Transnistria and will probably become permanent Russian territory, so forth. In my view, this could have all been prevented if the Minsk agreements had been sincerely implemented at an early stage or at least during the negotiations of recent months. Um, I also assume here are securing of borders by a new wall in Europe, nuclear missiles. This will leave Ukraine only as a narrow strip between Poland and the Russian Federation. And he's basically asking what the panel thinks of any of these scenarios. Are any of these realistic? What do you think? Um, Helga, why don't we start with you first and then go to the others? I would like to ask Colonel Black to answer first. Okay. Yes, um, it is interesting, the, uh, the involvement of Poland. Uh, there are uh, very credible reports that uh, Polish troops have been, uh, troop units have been inside of Ukraine. Um, I'm not sure how far to the east they are. They're not in to my knowledge, they're not engaged in, in active fighting with Russian troops, uh, but they certainly are in the Western parts. They may be doing logistics things, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, Zelensky is very pleased to have them there. And uh, he, he seems to be offering them almost citizenship uh, in his country. Um, which is rather a bizarre thing because you you don't uh, usually just welcome foreign troops into your country like that. It, it is it is threatening because Poland has has been unusually aggressive during this war. They they have sought nuclear weapons. They've asked for U.S. military bases to be established in their country. So. Um, that's one that bears watching, and I hope it doesn't continue to develop too far because this is the kind of thing, this is, this is the risk that we run. NATO is playing this enormously reckless, high-stakes game where something happens. Somebody says, well, let me do this. I'll insert these troop units, and the next thing, um, you have some conflict between Russians and Polish troops in Ukraine, and Poland begins to flood troops in, Russia does, and one thing and another. So it's very dangerous because Poland is, uh, you know, is rather aggressive about this. 
Now, you mentioned the Minsk agreements. Uh, the Minsk agreements were, were signed back in uh, 2014, 2015, and they, they were designed to sort of resolve the uh, military conflict where Ukraine was attacking the two uh, Donbass republics that had declared their independence. These were Russian-speaking areas, very heavily ethnic Russian, and um, and so there were agreements that uh, that were facilitated in Germany, uh, France, uh, uh, various countries were involved, and uh, and the idea was exchange prisoners, kind of have a ceasefire, and then and then develop a situation where you would have um, where you would have uh, uh, a sort of semi autonomy uh, granted. And that was never carried out other than the prisoner exchanges. And that has that has been problematic. OK, um, I have two questions for you, Colonel Black. I have a question for you, Ray, and one for you, Helga. And I think I'll probably do those in in, in that order. We're sort of converging on time. And there are a lot of questions still coming in. So I'm trying to. Uh, can't keep up with them, but all right. So Colonel Black, two questions. Uh, this one is from an individual whose name I'm going to just with help withhold. You'll see why it says Colonel Black. I have experiences in the Marine Corps from the 2000s that rever reveal the role of and he names some people to grow NATO for war with Russia and China without triggering an arms race. I also learned about the end game strategy, which appears to be going as planned. I heard this. I heard this from our former commandant while he was the supreme allied commander of NATO in Europe and other high ranking Pentagon officials. I did not collect evidence when I had the chance, but I know where to look. Is there a Freedom of Information Act request strategy that we can use to reveal this? Is there a way we can get enough veterans to come forward to work for peace? We need more Smedley Butlers and Dick Black and Dick Blacks. And he says sincerely gives his name. So that's the first question. But I'm going to ask the second one together with it, uh, which was directed to you. You'll see why. Uh, and this is from Jose Ricardo Martin. Uh, and he asks, Colonel Black, what is, the discre what is the discretionary power of the American president in terms of uh, taking war decisions? Would it be the case that the military, industrial, intelligence, and media complex has 99% of war and peace power decisions? Or does the president have any uh, veto on that power? Um, and then just in general, he's asking about the chances for nuclear war. But that's the second question. Okay. I, I, may, uh, I may black out here at some time uh, shortly because my, uh, my battery has run low. So I'll just get <laughs> into it. First, uh, I want to address the discretionary power of the president. Um, in theory, the president is the commander in chief. He makes the decisions on war and peace and, and treaties and, and all of this sort of thing with the advice, advice and consent of the Senate. In practice, um, as we saw with President Trump, Trump, uh, Trump took office with a view towards uh, withdrawing from NATO. You recall he didn't he didn't initially say oh we we want to just have everybody spend more money he said we need to we need to just you know get out of nato and uh, you can see immediately there was a plan set in place to overthrow him and and uh and it was at least partially successful uh president trump ordered the withdrawal of troops from syria and in response uh the uh Secretary of Defense resigned to throw the chain of command into chaos. And meanwhile, uh, John Bolton flew off to Tel Aviv and countermanded the president's order on, uh, on television in the Middle East. Um, uh, president Trump was, uh, was most patient with his, uh, with his national security advisor, because I'll tell you, had I been the president, uh, he, he would have had the most stinging public rebuke that any official had ever had. However, 
Uh, it is clear that the president has less than, than uh, full authority over the forces of the U.S., and this is very dangerous uh, in, in some ways. So, so that's the situation we have. As far as, as the expansion of NATO, uh, I have no question that the U.S. looks at NATO as a global tool. It, it started off when I was over there, it was a defensive alliance. 1991, when the Warsaw Pact dissolved, it became a very offensive alliance. It has been involved in wars of aggression in places like Syria, in Libya, other places. And uh, so it is, uh, it is a dangerous thing and we are using it as a tool and we're trying to expand its use in, uh, in Asia, where uh, what we've done is, is we have the, U the UK uh, making, making defense alliances over there. We have, we have Japan being a sort of, it's sort of like a friend. Oh, that, does that mean that his battery literally ran down? I guess that's what he was telling us. Okay, so he seems to have been uh, canceled uh, due to electronic interference. We'll leave it up to Ray to tell us whether that was done by intelligence agencies. And we obviously want to thank Colonel Black for everything he uh, contributed. There were other questions for him, and we'll forward those to, other, uh, to him. Uh, so everybody should relax. You can get your answers. All right, so... I, what I'll do now is I will go to you, Ray. There is a particular question. Uh, uh, just give me a minute. Oh, I have it. All right. Uh, and this is from Sharon. And she just asked this. She says, my understanding is that the military industrial complexes and pro-war lobbies, which are influencing U.S. politicians and their NATO, and, and as well as NATO policy, that mainstream media parrot the lies of the CIA, FBI, and they indulge in culture wars to distract regular U.S. citizens from real issues. What can a regular, U re regular citizen do? Well, a regular citizen needs to seek objective information elsewhere. I can't uh, rely on BSNBC or CNN. Uh, you can't rely on the New York Times or the Washington Post. The problem is um, a lot of Americans are working two jobs. They come home and uh, they feed the kids, they put their feet up and they want to be entertained and they turn on Fox News or something even worse. So uh, it requires a degree of responsibility, requires a degree of earnest searching for the truth. But that's why I welcome sessions such as this. I think that uh, what you've heard is a lot of truth uh, this morning and this evening. And uh, I would just say to Sharon, uh, hang in there, make sure you, you know where to look. And uh, I would re be remiss if I didn't say what my Webmeister, uh, Zohn, my, my uh, youngest son uh, says that I need to do every time I'm on the air. I um, mentioned the, the website that he runs for me. It's Ray McGovern dot com not hard to remember then he always says now, now dad when you say that when you say raymcgovern.com always add if you don't get it you don't get it all right uh helga let me ask this question and then we can have any final comments from you this is a question from dino gavancho peru he asks I am a Peruvian citizen of more than 40 years, and I have witnessed with astonishment since the bombing of Yugoslavia, the false flag attack on New York, the preventive wars on, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, now the use of Ukraine as a pretext to weaken Russia. All these attacks have been directed by interests of the Western banking industrial military complex using NATO as an executor and contrary to these deplorable, deplorable actions. I have progressively observed how the international press, political organizations, the governments fundamentally of the West and organizations of the United, State, United Nations itself have been diminishing their critical position against these actions. Uh, now it's almost non-existent. 
much worse than almost non-existent indignation of the population. We are facing the success of a process of social engineering, of a kind of control of public opinion. Um, and uh, this, this, this is sort of, we are subject to the interests of the elites. And again, what can be done? That's basically the uh, motive of the question. Well, I, I think the, the, the good thing, and I think Ray uh, <clears throat> indicated it already uh, <clears throat> to a certain extent, that you have right now a realignment in the world <clears throat> where, you know, the West, I mean, I can only say that from Germany, but, you know, the West in general, the Western establishments are so arrogant. They think they are the finest and the best and the smartest um, you know, you have U.S. exceptionalism, but you have European arrogance, which is not less uh, exceptional uh, for that matter. <clears throat> and they don't realize, you know, they, they keep saying that if they only go ahead with their policies, you know, sanctions, crushing this country, crushing that country, you know, that, that they will somehow submit all of these other countries into submission. But it is not happening. What is happening is that the weaponization of the dollar, for example, that the US Treasury first stole 9 billion from the Afghan people uh, and the Europeans, a couple of hundred millions as well. Then they, they uh, confiscated more than 300 billion of assets of Russia. Now that what has that has done is it has made the, the having your assets in dollar very risky and Many countries are thinking of how to get out of the dollar because your money can be stolen any moment. And what is happening right now is there is between many countries of Asia, especially the Eurasian Economic Union, they will have a summit in, I think, two days from now in Bishkek. Um, there will be a discussion about an alternative monetary credit system. China is doing more and more trade with Russia in ruble and rupee, uh, in ruble and uh, renminbi, with India in rupee and ruble and renminbi and rupee. Uh, so, you know, what is emerging is a completely different system based on the BRICS. Um, they just had a, a summit of the foreign ministers where there were many countries who want to be part of the BRICS. Argentina is one of them. Um, then I think Indonesia has requested to be part of it, several African countries. So the BRICS is growing. Then the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, they are also you know, integrating more in, in many fields. And many other organizations of the Global South uh, are tending to lean in this direction. And as, as I said, there is an emergence of a non-alignment spirit. Um, now, all of this is naturally taking place under horrendous conditions because you have a runaway hyperinflation. Countries are going bankrupt. Look at Lebanon, for example. It's just falling apart. Pakistan has an extreme economic crisis. Ukraine, uh, the economy is, is completely collapsing. Uh, Afghanistan, a, an absolute horror show. This is what the NATO left, you know, they couldn't care less. And there are now reports that the West is again supporting the opposition to the Taliban to undermine the Taliban in Afghanistan. But they lack very essential things, medicines and food. And, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's an incredible situation. So all of this realignment is not taking place under peaceful conditions, but under conditions of hyperinflation, of a world famine, of a world epidemic, a pandemic which is not yet uh, gone. Um, so it is very difficult, you know, to to say. And the only thing one can do is to strengthen the principles of peaceful coexistence, you know, of of nonviolence both in the social life but also in at large, you know, because I think. The UN Charter is uh, basically a nonviolent uh, <clears throat> document. And, you know, the Schiller Institute has started, actually, you know, when the pandemic started, we were forced to go to these uh, 
virtual conferences and that had some disadvantages because if you cannot meet people in person it it's um, you know it's it's not so good but on the other side it also allowed to expand into many countries and actually potentially all the countries so we are right now trying to build an alliance of forces of people who agree with this concept of a new uh, a new security and development architecture i want to invite you and your friends and everybody who is listening to actively think about that because this is you know an old order is falling apart the old paradigm is completely dead i mean there's no way how an unipolar world can be revived zero not with war not without war however what will be the shape of the new order is very much in flux and i think what is required is that there are a lot of people good meaning people who think what should be the principles which we as a human species give to ourselves to guarantee sustainable long-term survival of the human species. And since I think that this will be forced upon us by the circumstances, because we are going into a, a hot year, you know, famine, uh, hyperinflation, uh, supply chains not functioning. I mean, this will be a very traumatic situation. And, you know, this is the time where new things can be formed. And I think, you know, to bring in more forces of people who think this way and, you know, who think that peace is development, that the new name of peace is development, that we need to overcome poverty forever. I mean, the, the idea that there are several billion people who are not able to eat more than a meager meal per day, going hungry to bed, dying eventually of hunger. I mean, that is not the dignity of the human species. And I think we are now, we have reached a branching point in history, you know, where we have to overcome the injustice where only the golden billion, as the Russians are calling it, the, the billionaires. I mean, the billionaires have become so stinkingly rich, it's absurd, you know, while at the, at the other side, billions of people are starving and not making it. And that has to be corrected. We have to have a, a world order where every human being on this planet has a decent chance to fulfill their potentialities. Every baby which is born should have a decent education, develop its talents. Many of them will become geniuses. And that is the branching point at which we are. So I can only uh, tell you, go to Ray McGovern's website by all means, but also come to the Schiller Institute website, join our conferences, read our publications. We are publishing a weekly magazine in English. We have publications in Italian, Spanish, uh, French, Danish, Swedish, German, naturally. Uh, we are publishing a, a daily uh, alert. If you want to really be in tune with the best analysis you can get on a daily basis, find a way of subscribing to our daily alert. And, you know, more importantly, you know, join us as an organizer for a change to the better of humanity. And I think that that is what you should be doing. All right. Well, Ray McGovern, Helga Zepp LaRouche, I want to thank you for being with us. And obviously the panel has been summarized in the last message that Helga gave. Uh, we also want to thank, of course, uh, uh, Colonel Richard Black, uh, General Leonardo Tricarc Rico, and uh, Eric Denise for being with us as well. Uh, we're going to put up also our petition that I think many people have signed or have seen, but many have not. Uh, and uh, this is a petition which calls for convoking an international conference to establish a new security and development architecture for all nations. We want everybody that is watching to sign the petition, but also to circulate it. Uh, and you can take a look at that online. And again, we urge you to join the Schiller Institute and to join this battle for uh, human humanity and reason. So on behalf of the Schiller Institute and uh, I can think I can say on behalf of Helga as well. Uh, we want to thank everybody for joining us, and they will bring our forum and online conference for today to a close.